Good morning, ladies. Um, this is um, becoming a great tradition for me to actually speak on the system theme every year. Um, maybe at least this is the fourth year in a row that I've decided, rather than doing, you know, uh, offering schools a variety of different talks, which they're still entitled to ask for. Okay, I just say this, I've got the system theme for this year, would you like, be happy to hear a presentation on that? And the vast majority of schools say, yes, let's do that. And I do it also for the retreats, um, which is good for me in one way, because it's less work preparing than, you know, compared to preparing like a dozen different uh, presentations. But the downside is that I end up presenting on the same topic maybe 50 times plus, and it changes throughout the year. Uh, so I found that uh, it evolves in a way that you know, if I have 30 slides, then the first few times I present, I go through all 30 slides, you know, and I ram it through. But uh, by the end of it, somewhere around the 35th or the 40th time I'm presenting, I'm down to just focusing on three slides or something like that. But they're all good. That, that's, that's okay. I'm happy. But I've also learned not to make the presentation so long, so I've only got about maybe 10 slides for this one. I hope you find it interesting. So our, pre our theme for this year is uh, shine the light of Christ into the darkness of the world. That's our response. The, the quote at the bottom, the scripture at the, that's from the Acts of the Apostles, Acts 26, 16, is chosen by Pope Francis as the theme uh, in, for preparation, each year's preparation as we move towards the next Lord's Union Day. Now I've told last night that Yes, World Youth Day was meant to be next year, 2022 in Portugal, but it's been moved to 2023 and there's talk it might still be moved again because uh, unfortunately Europe compared to Australia is still struggling with COVID. We're in a good spot here in Sydney, in New South Wales and Australia in comparison. So anyway, we, the theme itself, I, I'll just speak uh, briefly about the idea of shining the light of Christ into the darkness of the world. When I saw that our system response was shine your light into the darkness of the world, I thought, well, that's rather bleak, isn't it? It's rather grim. I'm surprised they said that. Well, there are a lot of bleak things happening, unfortunately. There is a lot of darkness in the world. And, and you'll see throughout this presentation, there was plenty of darkness in the world when Christ came into the world. And the current situation is that, well, if you just look at the 20th century, I'm a bit of an amateur historian, so I, like, I sit down at home flicking through the best documentaries they've got on Netflix, and I like to see, you know, watch those documentaries. There was plenty of darkness in the 20th century. A terrible amount of darkness, <coughs> tra tragedy. And there's still darkness in the world, but we're family educators, we're positive people of faith, and it's our mission to be that light where we are. So I'm very excited to present about the idea of us shining our light where we are. Now, now I'll focus on the Acts of the Apostles first. If you go to the next slide, uh, I want to give you a bit of background to this, this verse and who does it involve. And it involves St. Paul. Stand up, I appoint you as a witness of what you have seen. Who knows anything about St. Paul and St. Paul as a witness? What can we say about St. Paul as a witness? His conversion, yes. He was persecuted. He was, he was persecuted, but he was a persecutor originally. Yeah, originally yes, yeah, yeah, he was a persecutor. Yes, and, he, and he did become persecuted as well, of course. And we read that throughout the Acts of the Apostles and his own epistles. What else do we know about St. Paul? What did he see? Be a witness of what you have seen. What did St. Paul see? Now, some people... Most people know who, who know their faith quite well know that St. Paul wasn't one of the original 12 apostles. In fact, there's no record of him having any encounter on, uh, with Jesus Christ while he was on earth. So how could he be a witness to Jesus, particularly the resurrection, if he wasn't a disciple or an apostle when Jesus was on earth? So what did St. Paul see? And what is he a witness to? Yes. Um, he saw like Jesus on the way to Damascus. That's like right. That's right. He saw the resurrected Jesus alive and reigning in heaven as king and law. That's a big thing to see. So St. Paul at the time, now St. Paul as a Pharisee was very sincere and very observant, very faithful. He really believed in the, in the, in the depth of his heart that the Christians were bad, that they were uh, against the law of Moses. 
and they, they threatened, they were an existential threat to Judaism. They despised the law, they didn't follow the law, they, they, they despised the temple, and they followed this really heretical uh, false prophet, sectarian leader, this Nazarene, Jesus, who was crucified, deservedly so, uh, put to death, dead and buried, and it should be all over. Uh, and so Paul was wanting to snuff out this threat, this false sect, and he was sincere and, and passionate about that. And God acknowledges sincerity, as misguided as we might be. Nevertheless, the sincerity is real. That's why it's called sincerity. Okay? And that's why Jesus singled him out and chose him and wanted to take control, so to speak, to utilize Paul's sincerity for the truth he did not yet realize. Okay? So he's on the road to Damascus. He sees that blinding light, knocks him off his horse, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? By persecuting the followers of Jesus, you're perse by persecuting the church, you're persecuting Jesus directly. Because the church is his bride. It's an extension of his, of his presence, of his action, of his work, his mission in the world. It's a thankless task of thine to kick against the goad. What does that mean? So Jesus said to St. Paul, it's a thankless task of thine to kick against the goad. Now that's old English, isn't it? Does anyone know what that could possibly mean? Walk a different path. Walk a different path. Well, yeah, yeah. to oppose, to go against, yes, yes. That's a very, that captures it quite well. Now, an animal is in the pen and you want, and the farmer gets the, the, the stick, that's the goad, the stick, and tries to get control and hit the animal into place where it should be. And the animal resists and kicks against the goad. But it's a thankless task, you're getting nowhere. Sorry, poor animal. You're going to end up doing what the farmer wants. Okay? And that's what St. Paul is told by Jesus. Look, Paul, you're sincere. Saul, you're sincere. But you know what? You're wasting your time. You're kicking against the goad. I'm going to, you, you've been shown the light. I'm alive. I'm reigning. I'm king. I'm Lord. I'm the Messiah. Now, you, you have seen that. I've revealed that to you as a gift. You'll be my witness of that to the world. And not just to the Jewish nation, but to the known world at the time. So, who knows any brief detail about St. Paul's mission as a witness in the decades that followed this great conversion? Does anyone know any snippets about his uh, missionary career? I don't like that word career, but his missionary in endeavours. Yes? Um, at one point, he was arguing with Peter about who should be baptised and who shouldn't, and like the whole circumcision thing. Well, he was actually, he did argue with St. Peter and he rebuked St. Peter. Remember, St. Peter's the first pope, and he rebuked St. Peter because St. Peter distanced himself from non Jewish Christians, right? He was, you know, that, that non Jews are still unclean. And the reality is that Paul's pushing the idea that in Christ we're all made clean through faith, baptism, right? We're made clean. There should be no more racial distinctions in our behavior. All right. Okay. So, anyone else want to hazard anything? I guess about or knows anything about the, the life and endeavours of St. Paul as a missionary, as a witness? Oh, you do know something. Oh, oh, don't be embarrassed. Don't hold back. What do we know? He wrote lots of letters. There you go. He wrote lots of letters. Now, when we look at the New Testament, it's twenty-seven books. 14 or 13 are attributed to St. Paul. At least 13 are St. Paul. Hebrews, we don't probably, but they're still, we don't know. Even since the third century, they've been speculated about whether Hebrews was written by St. Paul or not. But St. Paul wrote over half the Old New Testament. And more than half of the Acts of the Apostles relates to St. Paul. Okay, so he's converted around the year 37. He does his thing, missionizing, preaching Jesus in Damascus. Then he has to flee because he's, he's, he's threatened, his life is threatened. And then he goes off mysteriously into the desert of Sinai, Arabia, for three years. Basically, as a desert father, so to speak, perhaps. One of the first, if not the first, desert fathers. But then he comes back to Jerusalem around the year 40, has a conversation with St. Peter, St. James. And then he stays there for about two weeks, and then he heads back home. Where, is, where did he come from? Where is his hometown? Tarsus in Cilicia province in Asia Minor in Turkey. And he goes back just to work. 
goes back to be the normal Saul who's now he's you know, working as a tent maker. Then around the year 45, he's pulled out there by, of, from there by some Barnabas who invites Paul, let's do missionary work in Asia Minor. That's the first missionary journey to Cyprus and in towns, cities in what's called the province of Pisidia in Central Asia Minor. That lasts for four years, sets up seven new churches with St. Barnabas. Around the year 49, they're back in Antioch, then back in Jerusalem, and they're having that debate we read about in Acts 15, about whether non-Jews who are made, who come and accept Christ, whether they should be circumcised or not. Okay, and St. Paul's advocating that they shouldn't be. Okay, and that's the decision of the Council of Jerusalem, ultimately. That's upheld by St. Peter and even St. James as Bishop Jerusalem support. And they put that in writing and that's the, that's the missionary proclamation, that's part of the missionary proclamation of St. Paul as he moves forward into his second missionary journey where he re revisits those churches and then goes into Europe. And his second and third missionary journeys are in Europe, Macedonia, Northern Greece, uh, 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 Corinth, all those cities around Greece and the islands of Greece. His fourth missionary journey, this episode here precedes his fourth missionary journey. It happens around the year 60. And St. Paul's been arrested and he's been in house arrest for two years in Jerusalem. And because the, the, the Jewish authorities have been furious at his preaching uh, to Jews and non Jews alike in this part of the Eastern Mediterranean world, he's winning so many converts, both from Judaism and paganism. And he's doing wonderful work for Jesus Christ. But now he's arrested because he introduced one of his colleagues, St. Timothy, who was non-Jewish into the temple precinct. And the, the Jews are seeking his death, and St. Paul's not going to give away his life easily. So he's now appealing. And in the picture we have Festus, who's the Roman governor at the time. And we have the Herodian, the last of the Herodian kings, Herod Agrippa II, and his wife Berenice. Now, his wife was also his sister. Okay, you're shocked at that? Well, yeah, that's understandable. We should be. But a lot of the monarchies in the ancient world practiced incest because it was a way in their mind of preserving the purity of the royal bloodline, not to infect it with outsiders. Right, so the Egyptian pharaohs, particularly the Ptolemies, you know, the famous Cleopatra, they all married within themselves as brothers and sisters. Yeah. Now, St. Paul here tries to convert everybody. Festus says, Paul, you, you, all this reading of yours, you've gone mad. And Agrippa, Agrippa, Herod Agrippa II, his response is, look, Paul, you're trying to make me a Christian. Christian without much ado. You, you, you think you can just convert me very quick, quickly in one conversation. Okay. In the end, Paul says, I appeal to Caesar. And Festus said, you've appealed to Caesar? Well, to Caesar you shall go. And that's the beginning of Paul's fourth missionary journey to Rome. And we know about the story where he gets shipwrecked on, on Malta. And they, and they, they were nearly all lost. But the angel, well, an angel appeared to him on the ship and said, Fear not, Paul, you shall appear before Caesar. So he took his missionary witness to the highest power and authority in the world at the time, who was Nero Caesar. This was before Nero initiated persecution, the persecution of Christianity in Rome and elsewhere. So Nero's first exposure to Christianity would have been directly with St. Paul. There's no record of this, but we're just relying on what the angel said to Paul. You will appear before Caesar. So I can imagine what Caesar was thinking when he had St. Paul in front of him. And Paul was re re reproducing what he was trying to do here with Festus and Agrippa and doing that in front of Nero. And Nero would have thought, that's, that's, this is a religious fanatic, nutcase extremist. They didn't think much of the Jews, uh, but he's harmless. They let him go. And afterwards, Paul would have gone to Spain, as he indicated in his letter to the Romans. Then he would have swung back across to the eastern part of Europe. And he was arrested again in, around northern Greece during Nero's persecution. He eventually brought back to Rome. And our tradition tells us that St. Paul and St. Peter are martyred on the same day, June 29, the year 68. And that was the end of his gallant missionary endeavour. So he was a missionary and a witness of Jesus Christ. 
for nearly 25 years. So writing 14 letters, if he did write 14 or at least 13, is a lot in the, in the context of the New Testament, but it's not a lot for 25 years. Most of his missionary witness is oral, traveling, horseback, on foot, by ship, uh, going from place to place, etc., etc., and establishing new churches, ordaining clergy to continue on that witness in the local churches he had founded. All right, so that's the background of St. Paul as a great witness. And honestly, there have been few who've matched him in history. One that had would be St. Francis Xavier, who left, a, who left Portu Spain and Portugal in the 16th century to end up dying in China after going and being, doing missionary work in Japan, in the Indonesian islands, in, in India, um, in, uh, in, in, in one or two spots even in Africa on the way to India. Quite incredible missionary as well. So we'll move on. All right, now, we're talking about shining the light of Christ into the darkness of the world. Why should we believe that Jesus is the light? Tell me one reason why you, as a Catholic, as a family educator, have regard to Jesus as a light. Because as not everyone in the world accepts Jesus as a light, let alone the light of the world. So why do you accept Jesus as light or the light? It's a feeling, okay? That's a courageous answer. I'm glad you said that. Just, it's just a feeling. Why do any other one, anyone else here who gives any reason why you personally give credence to Jesus as light or the light of the world? I think it's referenced so many times in the Bible, the Old Testament, yes. the New Testament. Mm -hmm. so I, look, I've done research on it, right? And there's hundreds of references to the light. Mm -hmm. So I go with the majority and. Okay, good. Next, one more. Any? I think because whatever we have heard about the person of Jesus, we draw his goodness. Yes. And goodness is very light. We mm -hmm. associate goodness with, you know, being a light person, to shine light, shine a good example. That's right. When we look at the life of Jesus or what records we have, there's goodness. Now, uh, it was very difficult for Jesus at first to just be uh, accepted as, as anyone credible because he really didn't tick the boxes when it came to the expectations about what the Messiah would be. You know, he came from a very poor family. He, he was uneducated. Uh, he didn't have any you know, political clout or military clout. Uh, and so he wasn't ticking the boxes when it came to what the Messiah would be or what he would do. You know, he'd be a warrior, military figure like King David, Judas Maccabeus, who go against the Romans, who cast them out, who reign undisturbed until the end of time, victorious, glorious, all that. So, you know, we're talking about love your enemy. You're thinking, well, what do we love your enemy? We're supposed to drive the Romans out or pay taxes to Caesar. How can you pay taxes to Caesar? He's a, He's an idolatrous, false god. So Jesus wasn't ticking their boxes. What was the main way, or one way Jesus employed to get credibility in the minds of, of firstly, the Jews? I mean, he was a Jew who came to his own people, and they were waiting for the Messiah. How did he convince many that he was from God, that he was light, the light, that he was the Messiah? That's right. Miracles that cut through, you know. I'm just reading. I just read this morning in you know, chapters 11 and 12 of John's Gospel the miracle of the resurrection of Lazarus from the dead. It was an unbelievable. He'd been dead for four days. So and people knew that. So this was incredible. He must be from God if he's doing these things, as the blind man said, who was healed by Jesus. I mean, God does not do miracles through you know false prophets. He, he must be from God if he could do miracles like. This. But not everyone accepted him still. Because there'll be people who are resentful, hateful, jealous even uh, of Jesus and say, well, no, he's doing things, but it's by the power of Beelzebub. You know? And you read second century literature against Christianity, against Jesus, and that, and that literature tells you that Jesus was really a magician, a deceiver of the people who got his powers while he was in Egypt. Well, he was in Egypt. The Christians even teach he was in Egypt. He was in Egypt when he was a little boy, his mother and father, you know, while he, they escaped from Herod and he brought back the power of spells from Egypt, things like that. All right, so here are verses, and there are plenty more verses, but here are some sample verses that speak about Jesus as light. 
People who sat in darkness have seen a great light. In him was life, and the life was the light of men of all. The true light that enlightens. I am the light of the world. Very audacious statements, isn't it? Aren't they? Now, you take them for granted. I mean, you believe in Jesus. Most of you believe in Jesus axiomatically. That means automatically, without question, without debate. Why? Because you were born into a Catholic family. That's what your parents taught you. You were, taught, you were sent to a Catholic school. That's what you heard from sister X, brother Y, father, father X, whatever. Uh, and, and, you know, um, that's what you heard when you went to Mass on Sundays. And that's what you know about the Christmas story. That's what, you know, you didn't really question. But, you know, Jesus just turns up and he's a young man, uneducated, didn't go to any prestigious Jewish rabbinical school or whatever, and he's making these claims, they're big claims. You don't question them. I presume you don't question them, but you don't expect people to automatically follow this young rabbi from Nazareth, and Nazareth wasn't considered anything prestigious, by the way. If, you know, I tell you I come from Bankstown, you go, oh, ho hum. <laughs> and if I said I came from uh, Hunters Hill, you know, I would take you more seriously. Or Mossman, or Wallara, or you know, or Vaucluse. Oh, that guy's got to be successful. But you come from Punchbowl and Banks, now you're not really that successful, not that special, right? Well, Jesus comes from Nazareth, I hear. Does anything good come out of Nazareth? We read that in John's Gospel, chapter one, verse forty-two. Does anything good come out of Nazareth? Nothing. Well, I think it's quite interesting actually. If he came from Bankstown and was like from the sect of the Opera House, he probably would get arrested. Mm -hmm. That's true. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. But look, here. This man turns up and he says, I'm the light of the world. Now imagine me, just me. I'm working for Sydney Catholic School. Now I have some position in Sydney Catholic Schools, but over 30 years experience in education. And I have some qualifications to back me up. And if I was to turn up and say in front of every principal of principal's meeting and all these direct hires, I am the light of education. <laughs> I am the great Catholic. I am the culmination of 200 years of Catholic education in Australia. You know, I'm going to take it forward for the next 200 years. Okay, my spirit, my, my influence. But people say, who is this guy? You know, how dare he? Well, see, you can imagine why Jesus' statements here were audacious. And why he had to employ miracles, for example, to back up his claims. Yes, his teachings are beautiful. They're revolutionary in many ways. But, you know, they could be also a little bit extreme and, now, how can we trust this man? There's always false prophets and false teachers. How do we know he's the real deal? That's why you give merit. All right, let's look at the world. What was the world like when Jesus came into it? You know, the characteristics of the first century Greek or Roman world. Let's look at some of these characteristics. The pride, arrogance, luxury, plus horrible poverty as well. A lot of people like to think that the Greek and Roman civilization was, a, was the height of humanity and that we went backwards with Christianity. Far from it. We went forwards with Christianity. Brutality, gladiators, crucifixion. I mean, we took pleasure in sports where people were slaughtered. And we demanded their slaughter with the thumbs down. And animals by the millions were slaughtered in these games. Now, we're very sensitive now about horse racing, whipping the horse. Okay. And some animals get killed in these sporting events. But they did it for sport on a massive scale. They depopulated North Africa of wild animals in this frenzy of slaughter, not just in the Roman Colosseum, but throughout the Greco Roman world. Institutional slavery, racism. This is part of the cause. Yeah, up to 25, 30% of the population in the Roman Empire were slaves. And that's just part of the, the, the normality of the world. We're the masters of the world. We are a superior race, superior humanity. And we saw that come back in the 20th century, didn't we? Sadly, with Nazism, those type of evil. Disregard for women, children, the weak, the sick. This is a world for the strong. Survival of the fittest. And if you're not fit, you'll be left behind. You'll be discarded. It was normal in Greek culture, for example, Sparta, 
It was normal in Roman civilization. You're born weak, you're born deformed, you're born crippled, we leave you on the garbage tent. The very first beginnings of Christian, Christian orphanages and hospitals were Christians who went to garbage tips and rescued abandoned children and just informally adopted them. Now, you'd be hurt. You think, oh, that's the normal thing to do. But the normal thing in that society, the expectation was, they this should be just put to death. We've gone back to that, sadly. If you are told you've got a Down syndrome child in your womb, the doctors say, are you, are you, is, would you consider terminating that child? Because we think that that somehow, that defect, so to speak, makes them less human. Then we have unrestricted warmongering and no rules in war. Idolatry, superstition, magic as normative in society. Rape, divorce, abortion, uh, infanticide, suicide, euthanasia, unrestrained appetites. They weren't doing fasting and abstinence uh, for, for good religious reasons on a, on a general scale. You know, the Romans, wealthy Romans had a room called the vomitorium. When they're indulging in parties and that, and they're all full. Okay, got too much in here. Oh, I'm full. Oh, I go to the vomitorium and start again. This was a world in great darkness. That's why Jesus, we go back one slide, we have that first quote, people who sat in darkness and they didn't realise they were in darkness, have seen a great light. Jesus was the great light and the great revolutionary. The Jesus revolution began as a grain of sand on the, in the boondocks on the edge of the Roman Empire in a place that was despised the road in the mind of the rich and powerful at the time. There were certain philosophies that opposed elements of the above, but they weren't, they didn't have a consistent ethic. You, you can read through the great thinkers of the ancient world, Plato and Aristotle, Socrates before them, Seneca, Cicero, you see wonderful things there that Christianity would seize upon and say, hey, we're similar to you, but we can fill the gaps. They had gaps. All right? So Christianity was to build on the natural wisdom of the ancients, and they did have a lot of good natural wisdom, but they had a lot of gaps. Christianity would not seek to just swipe away completely and utterly uh, uh, the Greco-Roman collective wisdom, but they'll see where there was error, there were, where there were gaps, and where there were failings, and just fill them in, build on them. All right, what do we got next? The Jesus revolution is the opposite of what you saw. Uh, by the way, one word of caution here. What I just outlined about the first, this was the first century Greco-Roman world. One reason why we need to be stronger lights than ever where we are is because much of the first century mindset is coming back in the 21st century. You saw a lot of things on the screen there relating to first century that are now back in vogue and normative in 21st century society. And unfortunately, in 21st century society, we're going to do it better than 1st century society because we've got better science, medicine, and technology. As secularism increases and Christianity retreats further and further, which is going to go back more and more to how it was in the 1st century. We're going to do it better, as I said, because we're more advanced in our tech, the technology and science and medicine, etc. That's the tragedy. This is the light of Christ. If we talk about being witnesses about the light of Christ, it's, yes, we talk about his life, his passion, death, resurrection, ascension of heaven. That's the core of the good news. Because if Jesus didn't go through the pastoral mystery of, you know, passion, death, resurrection, and ascension, we wouldn't be followers of his today. We wouldn't be talking about him. But the whole package of the Jesus revolution is about his words, his actions, as someone dwelling among us to be the exemplar of how we should be as human beings. To, God becomes man to teach humanity what humanity really should be, who we should be as human beings. So Jesus emphasizes gentleness, humility, poverty. All these are the opposites of what you saw in that last slide. Mercy and forgiveness. These things are considered weakness and failure in the Greco-Roman world. But Jesus is bringing this revolution in to tell us, no, that's actually true. 
goodness and beauty, what we should be. Human dignity, love of neighbor, love of enemy, I should write that for you. Well, that's really tough. I don't know of anyone who really is perfect in that regard. I, I'm certainly not. Yeah. Loving your enemy is one of the greatest teachings, one of the greatest aspects of the life of Christ. Respect for women, children, the weak and the sick. We bless, oh, I've got love of the enemy there. Yeah. Blessed are the peacemakers and love of enemy. Faith, hope, and love, one God. Sacredness of marriage. You know, when Jesus talked about marriage, he shocked his audience to the core, especially his learned Jewish audience, because he abolished the, the, the concession that Moses gave, that a man, and only a man, had the right to put away his wife and marry another. When Jesus said, you can't do that, the, the God's original plan was one man with one woman. That's not how it was meant to be in the beginning. That's what Jesus said. One man with one woman until death. That shocked his audience. St. Peter said, then it's expedient that we don't get married at all. And Jesus said, with God, all things are possible. So he gives us the sacrament of marriage and the graces that come with us so that we can be faithful in marriage. Purity of heart, life of the spirit rather than the carnality of the flesh predominating. This is the most radical revolution that any revolutionary has ever brought into humanity. We always talk about revolutions. We talk about, in recent times, the American Revolution, the French Revolution, and we talk about the Russian Revolution, we talk about the Mexican Revolution, we talk about all these revolutions, industrial, technological, sexual revolution. Some of, them, some of these revolutions had some positive aspects, but none of them, none of these revolutions had the, the consistent positive aspects that this Jesus revolution, his life, brought into the world. And most of these revolutions also are working to undo the Jesus revolution. And the most pervasive revolution today that's working most assiduously to extinguish the light of Christ in the world is the sexual revolution. Because it's undoing everything Jesus taught about morality, love, relationships, marriage, sexuality, children, family. We, the Catholic tradition is <coughs> firmly on what Jesus taught here. The modern world is, is re relentlessly undoing that. So these are just, just the highlight, the high points of some of Jesus' most enlightening teachings. When you talk about enlightenment, I have to throw this in too, sorry. You're, I come across a lot of young people who get fascinated about very esoteric things like the Illuminati, you know. Oh, the Illuminati, and they go all into conspiracies and they're all on websites and net and, you know, YouTube and looking at the Illuminati. You know who the Illuminati really are? The Illuminati is Jesus Christ and those who are his followers. Because Jesus Christ is the true light. So he's the Illuminati one. So the authentic Illuminati is not some vague conspiracy that was behind the American Revolution or the French Revolution. The real Illuminati is Jesus and his followers, because they're the ones that bring in the true light into the world. Blessed are the peacemakers. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And do to others as you would have them do to you. That last one, you know, there would have been a lot of ancients in the first century who would have thought, you know, that's not too bad. That's what we want. We should, we, we should, you know, do to others as you would have them do to you, yeah? But they would agree that we should be treated well, but they would find it very difficult to treat people in the same way, to reciprocate that. Because you really need God's grace to be that unselfish. To live this out what requires unselfishness, requires a type of love that is not natural to us. We need God's grace to enlighten us, strengthen us, and move us to love others in the same way we expect to be loved. Just go back one slide too. Teachings like this, when Jesus came into the world, and for centuries afterwards, if you read about Christianity in the early centuries before it became legal, one thing that people brought against Christianity is that your teachings sound nice, but they're very unreasonable. This was probably one of the most unreasonable in the eyes of many people in the ancient world. 
You're a Roman, you're a Roman, and you're proud of your empire, and you know that on the other side of the frontiers there, all these barbarian types, you know, Germania and the Huns and the Goths and all that, you, know, you expect us to love them? What do you mean love them? They're coming over the borders in, as, as hordes with their spears and their shields and their arrows, and we're, we're, not, we're not in a position to love them. If we love them, we're finished. We have to slaughter them. Okay? That's why we call them barbarians, because they're inferior to us. The Greeks called anyone who are not Greeks barbarian. Okay? Uh, but you know, in the more general sense, barbarian is obviously inferior to who we are. Right? And we can't be practicing what the Christians taught. It's just unreasonable. Let's move on. And again. All right. Now, Jesus left the world and he left behind his church his followers to continue his work. And they had to suffer terribly for centuries. I'm about to finish a book called by, uh, by an ancient writer called Eusebius, The History of the Church. He wrote this in the early 4th century. And most of the book is a recording all those who were put to death for following Jesus, for following Jesus Christ. So it's a chronology of not just who were bishops and leaders in the church, but all the martyrs and what they went through. And it was terrible. So Jesus basically, you know, he actually warned us in advance that, you know, I'm going to send you a sheep among wolves. And there'll be wolves attacking these followers of Jesus for centuries. Eventually, though, it took 250 years. Eventually, Christians became numerous enough that they actually, the Romans got tired of slaughtering them. They just couldn't kill them. Um, so the last persecution by Diocletian was really an act of madness because by the time the early beginning of the fourth century when he launched that persecution about 30 percent of the Roman population or the empire's population were Christian so that would have been you know over 20 million and then they go to war against Christians to force them all to renounce Christ or, or slaughter them all and it ultimately failed not only did it fail, but ultimately a man came to be emperor who was very heavily influenced by Christianity. Who recognises who this person is? Who's been to Rome here? Many of you have. Who's, who would have seen this? I've, I've stood right in front of this particular head. It's huge. It's about four feet high. It's not just a little thing like that. It's really big. Who's this fellow here? His name's on the screen. <laughs> Constantine. His mother is a saint, recognised as a saint in the church, St. Helena. And he eventually comes to power, not just in the Western Empire, but the Eastern Empire as well. And he does something wonderful for Christianity. What does he do? Does anyone know? He made it legal. He gave it freedom of religion. He passed the law in March 313 with the Emperor of the East, Licinius, to give Christians freedom of religion, freedom of worship. And, be, and then 67 years later, in 380, the Emperor then, Theodosius I, would go the next step and say the official religion of the Roman Empire is Christianity. And it's Catholic Christianity as against Arian Christianity. It's a Christianity that believes in the Trinity and that the divinity of Christ. He began a slow process that would take many centuries of, the, of making the light of Christ actually the law of the land. And it was going to take a long time. And it was never to be perfect. This is the beginning of building a new world which eventually came to be known as Christian, Christianness, a Christian civilization, which was never perfect, but certainly better than what had preceded it. And the first steps that he brought in was the outlaw gladiatorial fight. He outlawed something that was in place for 500 years plus. This sport, I mean, so imagine I become Prime Minister of Australia and say, I'm abolishing AFL. I'm abolishing NRL. At least I'll abolish the Sydney Roosters. Most people would agree with that, but anyway. Okay. And abolish um, what is it, horse racing. Imagine the uproar if I do that. Greyhound race. Greyhound race, But Bruce Baird, what is it, Bruce Baird? Oh, probably in the bank. Mike Baird. Bruce is his father. Basically, he went downhill in his political career when he banned greyhound racing. 
were Constantine, Constantine banned gladiatorial fights. Because why out of Christian principle? We don't kill people as entertainment. Outlawing killing of slaves and branding them on the face. Now, slavery was going to take a lot longer to phase out. It had to take centuries to phase out because it was so inherently, intricately intertwined with the whole economic system of the empire. And then you'd have making Sunday a day of rest. Now, you know what's motivating that, right? You know, there's commandments, the Judeo-Christian commandments, keep holy one day a week. We have one day a week where we can dedicate to just rest and, and um, you know, worship of God. So this is the beginning of a new world order. Next. Now, I'm going to, the next two slides engage you more. I've just given you tiny grains in the next two slides of examples of the light of Christ con conforming the world, transforming the world, Introducing into the world goodness, truth, and beauty that previously did not exist, or augmenting them. And then individuals in the next slide who are examples of light. So when you look at the screen now, you see things that are, you know, physical or actions. Tell me, if I point to these, what do you see? You take the initiative now and tell me what do you see on the screen and name it as a, a fruit of this new world build, being built influenced by the light of Christ. What do you see here that somehow a light of Christ being instituted in the world? Yes. Yes. And what does that tell you? What's that an example of? Of the great sorrow and what we've lost in the world yeah. when what we used to do was happened and the humanness of that whole um, vision of to see what we've actually done to him and what we've lost. So we you're, you're, going, you're going very deep there spiritually. Your answer is deeper than what I'm actually asking. But it's a very good answer. What I'm asking, what I'm saying here, when you see things like architecture, art, music, stained glass windows is another expression of architecture and art. Right? Same with its sculpture here. What Christianity brought into the world, introducing the world higher levels of beauty, magnificence. You know, our modern world today wants to tell us repeatedly about the bad things we've done. Okay, we've done many bad things, we'll come to them. But we've got to remind ourselves what are many what are some of the many beautiful things that Christianity brought into the world. And even more important than this, when we look at these other slides. What other things did Christianity, the, the light of Christ, bring into the world? What do you see here? Serving the poor, Serving the poor and the hungry. Yeah. And looking after is that else? The sick. Yes. Hospitals. Hospitals began with Christianity. Back in the, after Constantine, there was another pagan emperor called uh, Julian. And he was a nephew of Constantine and hated Constantine because Constantine massacred his family. That's good. Yeah, right? And Constantine did not get baptized until his deathbed because he knew as an emperor he had to do things which were contrary to the Christian faith, sadly. Right? Julian said, We can't compete with the Christians unless we act like them. We have to do what they do orphanages, hospitals, etc. Hospitals, caring for the sick, the weak, the dying, the neglected. What's this tell us? What, what other thing did Christianity bring into this? Education. Education. Okay, mass education has been the since the 19th century, sure. But, you know, uh, we've got all the, we're celebrating 200 years of Catholic education in Australia. That's two centuries inspired by the church and the concern, the church's concern, Christ's concern for everybody, all and sundry, irrespective of your background, your wealth, your privilege, your position, etc. So we see many examples of the light of Christ institutionalized in society. Now, the next slide is a looking at these individuals, you're going to tell me here, you're going to name what was the particular light, name each person and their special light that they introduced into the world. Who's this person? What is this light? Love of animals, love of life. Love, there, love. Love, essentially. Yes, love of neighbour. Love of creation. Seeing God <coughs> reflected in He loved creation. Because you saw God reflected by creation. And also humility. The, 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 the
value of poverty as against those who are excessively obsessed with just material acquisition. Who's this woman? What's her lot? Ah, uh, you should answer this one. Who's this woman? That's right. What's her light? That's right. Wrote spiritual classics. It was, she had she had a direct conversation with God the Father. Her dialogue of St. Catherine of Siena is a spiritual masterpiece of the highest order. She died young, by the way, and she was never a nun. She was a lady, third order Dominican, dies at the age of 33. You're going to be shocked to hear me say this. Her, from the age of eight until 33, she ate nothing. She lived only on the Eucharist once a day for 25 years. That's a Eucharistic miracle, officially acknowledged. Her contribution as light in the world, she single-handedly broke the power of the French kingdom, the French king and the French cardinals and their domination of the church who, when they had the Pope not residing in Rome for 70 years, but residing in Avignon, the papal territory within France. And it was her mission, and she succeeded in accomplishing it, of convincing the Pope to go back and be Bishop of Rome in Rome. And so her power, what she achieved was miraculous. Okay? And she was obviously a great reformer in wanting to see the church reform, because reform in the church has been stagnated because of this unfortunate episode. Who's this man? What's his light? That's right. What's his light? Helping us. Oh, absolutely. If we got Vinnie's today in the world, centuries later, it's because of what he established in France. You see what we can do? Those who shed light, the light of Christ, can have an impact on the world that lasts for centuries. While on the converse side, those who shed darkness, can bring enormous ruin and have their darkness impact the world for centuries. Look at the 20th century. I'll say it, I'll name it. Terrible people like Adolf Hitler, Joseph Stalin, Mao Zedong. Between those three alone, their political power, their ideologies resulted in the death of around 150 million people. 70 million people died under Chairman Mao in China. Hitler started the war, they killed 55 million. Stalin murdered 20 million of his own people, let alone co-starting the Second World War with Adolf Hitler. And there are many other evils too. There's plenty of darkness, but our call is to shine light, which can impact many people for long after we live. Who's this man? What's his light? John Baptist de la Salle, patron saint of Jesus. teachers, starting a school, a religious order and a school system that impacts on the lives of millions for centuries. Now it gets harder. Who's this man in his light? i give you one clue. Who drinks milk here? Say it. She has already said it. You saw it. Who is it? Who is it? Louis Pasteur. Now, what? He's a Catholic. He's a scientist. His his light is his light is to improve the world uh, through natural means, but inspired by his faith as well. He shows us that he can be a great man of faith and a great man of science, and they're not incompatible. He's on the train one day as an old man traveling. Across France, somewhere. he's from Breton in northwest France, which is pretty bogan territory by French cultural standards. He's considered simple people of faith. He's on the train playing his rosary openly, and some young upstart sits in front of him and he gets, starts a conversation with him. So, listen here, old man, you've got to give up this superstitious stuff. You know, come on, it's the 19th century now, the century of progress, of science, technology, medicine. Research and above all, and, and, and Louis Pasteur is just listening politely. And you know, thank you. Yeah, I, I'm listening to what you say, young man. And and what's your name, young man? And he, he tells him his name, and then he said, 
And the young man said, what's your name? He said, oh, my name's Louis Pasteur. End of the conversation. <laughs> okay? Who's this man and his contribution? Hmm? Oh, a good try, but no. He had enormous light. So Maximilian Kolbe, enormous light in the world. But no, not that he's a priest from Belgium, a monsignor, but also a scientist. What's his contribution to the world? To show the compatibility of faith and reason, science and religion. He was mocked. He proved from science that the universe had a beginning. The science of the time, at the time, an atheistic science that says there's no God, there's no creator, the universe wasn't created, it didn't begin, it's eternal. The Fred Hoyles of this, the Professor Fred Hoyles of this world, that's what they were teaching and prevailing in science. And this man, Father Monsignor George Lemaitre, said no, the universe had a beginning and we can trace it back. We're seeing the universe expand outwards from the central point. Going backward, it began 13.7, 13.8 billion years ago. Fred Paul said, oh, it looks this Big Bang Theory. That he mocked it as the Big Bang Theory. There's this guy in Germany named Albert, takes all the data, and then he had reviews it all. You know, peer review of this you know, upstart Catholic priest pretending to be a scientist. And this Albert fellow says, no, he's right. Albert, his full name was Albert Einstein. Verified the work of George Lemaitre, our father George Lemaitre, and now it's normative science without question. Who's this man in his life? Who reads? Who's in the English literature here? No, 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 that's the, the, both good guesses. Tolkien. And he wrote what the English Literature Society voted in the 20th century as the greatest novel of the 20th century. What was his trilogy that he wrote? The Lord of the Rings. Rings. Right? Which is really a story about the struggle between good and evil, light and darkness. He's a soldier on the Western Front, the Battle of the Somme, 1916, fighting the Germans. And he conceived this idea, Mordor in the Lord of the Rings is imperial Germany. And Gandalf in the White Robes is the Pope. Because Gandalf, he took the name from Castel de Gandolfo, which is the Pope's summer holiday residence. Castel Gandolfo is the name for Gandalf in Lord of the Rings. And he's a very moral man, very Catholic man. Who's this person in his life? Doctor. I deliberately kept the young girl in the picture. Who's the doctor? Died in 1994, made by the church venerable just a couple of months ago. Dr. Le, Professor Jerome Lejeune, who discovered the link between chromosomes and Down syndrome. And he's there with the girl with Down syndrome. And he, unlike the pagan Romans, says that this girl is not subhuman, not inferior, has a human dignity, and is a child of God and deserves to live. So he's an, he's an office. He's in opposition, not just to the first century, but the 21st century mindset, which says that this girl can be destroyed if you want her to be destroyed. Who's this woman and her contribution? That's right. She was a nun in the Loretto Order, working in India, doing really good work, educating the Indian elite. One day she's on a train, and this absolutely miserable beggar, most, when I say miserable, I mean that in the sense of a person who is in a terrible condition, who needs mercy, begging for food from him. And she hears the voice of Christ speaking to, through him to her to now serve the poorest of the poor in the black hole in Calcutta. And she says something to us which is very relevant to you, to me, all of us in this room about shining the light of Christ. Words that should encourage us. We're not called, God does not call us to do great things. He calls us to do little things with great love. That's how we shine our light in the world. That's how we make an impact where we are. Who's this young fellow? Social media. Yeah. That's right. Patron, blessed of social media, Carlo Acutis, dies at the age of 15. I think from leukemia, is that right? put together a website on Eucharistic miracles. You read his writings, what's recorded in his sayings. 
his, as a teenager, his spirituality, when you read what, what I've read of what he said, is at the level of the spiritual masters, doctors of the church. It's, um, it's unbelievable what I read this teenager saying about his spiritual life, the interior life, a Eucharistic devotion that he had. Um, my challenge when I'm in front of teachers, when I do this presentation in front of teachers, I'll be challenging them differently than I am you now. I'm going to say, what if there was a Carlo Acutis in our schools today? How would he be treated by his peers? Other than his friends in the classroom. They'll treat him as some type of freak, weirdo. Even more dangerous, if he was a teacher in our schools, how would he be treated? That's the challenge that we have. Are we comfortable with the Carlo Acutis in our classroom? Are we comfortable with the Carlo Acutis in the staff? Because he's been beautiful and he probably will be canonized one day. Well, together with that other Italian, Pierre Giorgio Frassati, as young men who bucked the trend and the culture of their day. You know, what are 15 year olds thinking in 2006? The last thing I'll be thinking about is Eucharistic miracles, daily communion, praying the rosary, consecrating himself to uh, uh, he, he, he was I don't know if he formally did it, but he wrote about uh, the only woman I want in my life was the Blessed Virgin Mary. And very few teenagers would be thinking and writing things like that. Next slide. We haven't always got it right. We've made mistakes. And over the centuries we made terrible mistakes. You can see some of them listed on the screen. Unjust wars, even launched by popes in the Renaissance period. Inquisitions involving torture, forcing people into truth. You can't force people into truth. Okay? Corrupt popes, I'd say at least 30 in the history of 266 immoral popes. Countries who are supposedly Christian, like England, Spain, Portugal, the United States, engaging in institutional slavery. And we still live with the consequences today. Institutional abuses in our, in our orphanages, in our schools. Sex abuse crisis on a mammoth scale in the 20th century, particularly in the second half of the 20th century. <coughs> Clergy scandals that you read about of all sorts all the time, with money or women or whatever. That doesn't, should not deter us from turning our gaze away from Jesus as the light and recommitting ourselves to being vehicles of that light in, uh, where we are, where we operate. John Paul II, back in 2000, March 13, 2000, uh, in the Jubilee year celebrating the 2000th anniversary of Christianity, of the Incarnation, made an apology for all these sins that we committed sins in the service of truth general sins sins against christian unity against the jews against respect for love peace and cultures against the dignity of women and minorities against human rights yeah i'm here, not here just to tell you the the good news that we have to be truthful about all the news and we have to admit the wrong and uh, and that's how we are people of truth and integrity if we're going to move forward in the world today and continue uh, with the quest that we have been given to respond. So our next slide is how do we respond? Uh, sorry. Someone else. The next slide tells us that we as a system, we're in the 200th anniversary of Catholic education. We're celebrating that this year. Many remarkable achievements over the centuries. We can see there the current stats, how we've been a witness to Christ, shining the light of Christ over these two centuries. Started in 1821, a small thing in a small part of the world, at the bottom of the world, Parramatta. It used to take three days to travel. It used to take three days to travel from Sydney CBD to Parramatta in 1803. That's the same time it takes today with our modern roads. Anyway, that's <laughs> <laughs> no. And you pay tolls for it. Too. And we pay tolls for it as well. Yeah. 
and we've got now 1,750 primary and secondary schools, nearly 800,000 students, nearly 100,000 staff, over 50,000 students in Catholic universities, and my favourite, because I are the catechists, the 6,000 volunteer catechists in state schools, who are the most, the most beautiful people in our church, the soul of the earth, who are saints working in very difficult places, plus the Catholic chaplains in the secular university. So that's, we should mention this, particularly now on this 200th anniversary, um, and we're part of this. And likewise, many good things, and, and, many, and sometimes we haven't succeeded. Sometimes we have failed as well. There are people in our system who are bright, shining lights. There are others who are not. The Family Educator Project would be above average when it comes to shining the light. And I think now is the next slide where we respond. What is our response? We've got one minute, I think. <laughs> All right, and this is you answer this privately. You've got a notepad, you've got a pen. I'm inviting you to write down your private answer. I'm not going to read it. I'm not going to ask you to read it, but how do you respond? The next 200 years, we won't be along around. Maybe Maria might be around. 1898 onwards, right? But the next 200 years, we have a role to play. How will I shine the light of Christ moving <coughs> in our system, in our homes, among our families? among our friends? That's the most critical answer. And I think you know how you will shine that light. And you can have more than one answer. Make that commitment. Recommitment. Personal commitment. That's why we have retreats. We renew, reinvigorate, and go back to where we belong, where we are, that small place, in that small part of the world, but it's, it might not be important in the minds of many, but it's important in the mind of God who placed you. Right. On that note, we can finish. And thank you very much. Thank you.